Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am Matt Bennett, here to continue our series on the heartbeat of business. Uh, We have been exploring uh, the first few chapters, so if you're new to the podcast, Highly encourage you to go to episode one of this series. It'll just catch you up. Um, if you are new, we are posting chapters uh, from the audiobook, and then uh, Dr. Hopper, Dr. Hazan, and myself are discussing those in more detail. So we would love for you to join the conversation, but don't want you to feel lost jumping in about a third of the way through. So uh, you can go back and visit that. For those of you watching us on YouTube, Obviously, watching an audiobook gets a little bit boring. You can find us pretty much anywhere else, or you know, just go for a walk and listen to us on your walk. So, um, I really, uh, for a lot of people, and maybe for the individual, but also the manager, I really think chapter three uh, that you're about to hear, very important chapter, really looking at how heart rate variability might be able and could be used to quantify burnout. Uh, how we, even if our mind, even if our bodies aren't quite telling us that we're struggling with stress, heart rate variability might be an early warning signal uh, to that. And obviously, as our mind and body realizes we're struggling with stress, uh, how heart rate variability can help with the recovery process, how we can support coworkers and those that we supervise. So really exciting discussion. We really define burnout in this chapter in some detail. Uh, I think looking, well, I I believe over the years, I I found this to be true, you know, looking at burnout as stages that somebody goes through instead of an all or nothing sort of thing that someone experiences is also very useful. So we explore all that and more in this chapter. So enjoy chapter three next week. Ina, Dave, and myself will be back. Talk about a little bit, go into further insights. Uh, as always, feel free to join the conversation. You can always email me directly at matt at optimalhrv.com. We'd love to hear from you. love to get your thoughts um, on this as well. We're also giving away free ebook copies of the Heartbeat of Business, as well as my uh, Heart Rate Variability, The Future of Trauma-Informed Care. Uh, you can go to our website at OptimalHRV.com. Scroll down a little bit. You'll see a free book link. Uh, download those. Again, love to, we're hoping that uh, 2023 is a year of resiliency and recovery for everybody. So we want to support that in everywhere we can. So enjoy Chapter 3. We'll be back next week. Chapter 3. Job Demands, HRV, and Burnout. In this chapter, we put HRV science into a practical context for leaders and businesses. To understand the connection between burnout, performance, and business outcomes, we utilize the Job Demand and Resource, JDR, model. We chose the JDR model because of its simplicity and 20 years of research to support its efficacy. The JDR model provides leaders and businesses with concrete tasks to help manage distress and burnout to help avoid adverse business outcomes. The decades of research behind the JDR model correlate health with performance and productivity. The innovation of HRV is its ability to quantify the impacts of distress from job demands. Technology now provides daily and weekly data on the effects of stress on health. We will start our exploration of the JDR model by exploring the connection between job demands, distress, burnout, and outcomes. According to the originators of the JDR model, job demands are the physical, psychological, social, or organizational aspects of the job that require sustained physical and or psychological effort or skills. Therefore, they are associated with certain physiological and or psychological costs. As mentioned earlier, some stress, called eustress, increases motivation, while negative stress, or distress, harms health and wellness. In this chapter, we will examine what happens when the physiological and or psychological costs lead to burnout.
Future chapters explore eustress and motivation. The graphic showing the complete JDR model is figure 7 in the handout. A note, while we are utilizing the basic structure of the JDR model, our graphic adds some details to incorporate the science discussed in the first two chapters. Appendix 3 in the handouts includes the complete model and supporting definitions. Distress and burnout threaten to destroy the collective cognitive capacity and emotional and relational health needed for individuals and teams to thrive. As we will discuss in this chapter, HRV helps quantify the impact of burnout on cognitive, medical, mental, and relational health. As people struggle, outcomes suffer, creating a terrible cycle for individuals and businesses. Understanding that their performance and work fail to achieve the desired results only furthers burnout and its dangerous effects. The inverse is also true. Wellness creates the energy that fuels successful business outcomes. Successful outcomes increase motivation and engagement, creating a self-reinforcing cycle as HRV, morale, and engagement soar. The JDR model lays down a specific leadership challenge, support people in managing the distress from job demands, or suffer adverse outcomes. HRV provides an effective daily measure of both the people's resiliency and the leader's ability to structure their work in a way that prevents burnout. Distress and Burnout Burnout is the enemy of productivity, creativity, healthy cultures, and positive business results. Let's define burnout based on the science of stress and the nervous system, as already presented. Burnout happens when the following occurs for a sustained period. Distress levels start to increase. Vagal tone decreases, leading to more sympathetic or dorsal vagal activation, increasing levels of anxiety and depression, and causing a lack of usual energy. Distress levels cause more activation in the amygdala and less in the prefrontal cortex, decreasing cognitive ability, emotional regulation, and relational health. A significant drop in the last week average when compared to the all-time average. People hold too much stress in their cups and behaviors become more rigid or chaotic. There is a great deal of research surrounding burnout and the long-term consequences of work distress. Here are just some of the findings on occupational distress and burnout. Impact on physical and medical health. Heart disease. Stroke. Type 2 diabetes. Cancer. Musculoskeletal disorders gastrointestinal disorders, autoimmune disorders, chronic fatigue, sexual issues, headaches, colds and flu, back problems. Impact on psychological health, feelings of incompetence and doubt, a negative attitude about work and the rest of life, memory loss, cognitive decline, early onset Alzheimer's disease, drop in IQ, loss of creativity and cognitive flexibility, sleep problems, shame, mental fatigue, anxiety and irritability, depression, guilt, aggression. Impact on social and occupational health. Social isolation or relationship issues. Poor job performance. Decrease in morale. Decrease in motivation. Absenteeism. Tardiness. Theft at work. Turnover. 40% is stress-related across different fields. Grievances and complaints, litigation, low job satisfaction, injuries. It's not overly dramatic to say that chronic work stress kills people and businesses. Poorly managed distress levels rob individuals of the cognitive, medical, mental, and social health they need to succeed at work and enjoy life. Burnout causes teams and businesses to operate well below their potential while opening them up to various risks. The good news is that HRV provides people and their leaders with daily feedback on their health and productivity. HRV serves as an early warning sign, allowing people to take action before they experience the negative consequences listed above. It also helps measure the health of the business culture, the effectiveness of wellness efforts, and the impact of human resource strategies. Quantifying Work Distress 
A daily HRV reading provides a great deal of helpful information when compared to longer-term averages. A morning reading compared to 30-day or longer averages offers feedback on the impact of distress and the allostatic load of the previous day or days, the energy they have for their workday, and how well sleep restores physical and mental health. Daily morning readings serve as an early warning that the distress from job demands threatens burnout. Morning HRV readings also help people plan their days based on their current state of wellness. A lower-than-average score means they might not possess the usual energy and stamina for the day. While a low HRV score does not require them to call in sick, it does alert them to limitations on their emotional regulation and cognitive flexibility. They might want to focus on less challenging tasks if possible. If this is not possible, they should avoid making hasty decisions, ask coworkers to double-check their essential work, and take small breaks throughout the day. They should also fall back on healthy habits, such as a salad for lunch, a walk or slow jog after work, and some quick mindfulness practices. The inverse is also true. If a relatively healthy person's HRV score is close to or above baseline, they are ready to take on new challenges and push themselves if necessary. A strong HRV score does not permit them to slack off on healthy habits. In fact, they might want to do a more strenuous workout as their body is both physically and mentally ready to perform. HRV also quantifies the impact of the allostatic load accumulated during the workday. Taking a reading before work, for many this is their morning reading, and then a reading after work provides information on the allostatic load accumulated during the workday. The goal with before and after work readings is not to improve HRV scores, as the typical workday will decrease HRV. Instead, the goal is to understand how the allostatic load impacts wellness and to use this information to utilize wellness strategies after work. If successful, these strategies will promote recovery and help them bring their best to work the next day. A moderate drop in HRV, a workout, a healthy dinner, a quick mindfulness practice, and a good night's sleep will set them up for a great day tomorrow. If the after-work HRV score is significantly lower, it shows that their nervous system is struggling with their allostatic load. A hard workout or intellectually strenuous activity might increase the risk of illness or injury. If energy is crashing, the person should practice mindfulness, go for a walk in nature, eat a healthy dinner, and get to sleep early. These restorative practices help their bodies and minds recover, and their HRV should improve. We will take a deep dive into best practices for wellness later in this audiobook. Regardless of the industry, there is a possibility that traumatic events might occur in the work environment. In healthcare, law enforcement, or social services, professionals may experience a person getting angry and attacking them, committing suicide, harming another person, passing away, overdosing, and other events that are traumatic for individuals and teams working with vulnerable populations. Those in retail or hospitality might experience an angry, threatening, or even violent customer. Traumas can happen in every industry, including bullying, layoffs and firings, workplace violence, and injuries. Other traumas might occur outside the work environment but still traumatize people, such as the death of a friend or family member, a natural disaster, a personal health emergency or diagnosis, and terrorism. HRV provides insights into how these events impact mental health and whether human resources and other strategies are helping support recovery. A trauma will result in a dramatic drop in HRV. Unlike a tough couple of days at work or other short-term stress, trauma threatens long-term cognitive, medical, mental, and social health. Many leaders feel that they do not possess the skills to help people who experience trauma. Leaders are not therapists. Leaders walk a tricky line of providing adequate support to the individual while keeping overall performance steady. Employee assistance programs that offer free therapeutic services are an excellent investment as they provide leaders with a tangible resource to provide the support that someone needs to overcome the trauma. 
fostering an organizational culture with an open, non-judgmental, and non-retaliative response to requests for help is extremely important as a foundation to an emotionally healthy workplace. Stages of Burnout To this point in our discussion, we have examined burnout as a state, as if people are either burned out or they are healthy. While this approach is helpful for introducing the concept, it is more accurate to conceptualize burnout as a process, with symptoms increasing over time. A simple four-stage model of burnout helps demonstrate the escalating effects of distress on people's well-being. The four stages are 1. Exhaustion 2. Guilt, shame, and doubt 3. Cynicism and callousness and 4. Crisis As people progress through the stages, they experience the symptoms of the stage they are in and those of previous stages. The higher the stage, the more anxiety, sympathetic activation, or depression, and dorsal vagal activation are apparent and the lower the quality of work. The primary goal is to stay out of these stages altogether. The secondary goal is to recognize the symptoms of the early stages and take action to get out of that stage before moving to higher stages. Exhaustion The first stage, exhaustion, is something almost everyone struggles with from time to time. While the goal is to stay out of the stages of burnout, the distress of modern life and work makes it nearly impossible to go more than a few months without experiencing some level of exhaustion. Most people exist a few tough days away from falling into this stage. Early identification of exhaustion is critical because if people do not address it, they are at risk of quickly moving into more harmful stages. HRV provides an early warning of exhaustion when the seven-day average falls considerably, 15% or more, below 30-day or all-time averages. Recognizing that we are on the edge of exhaustion allows people to take small actions that help get out of that stage and back into wellness. Identifying warning signs can provide an early indication that someone's cup is holding too much stress. Physical, psychological, and social warning signs usually accompany significant drops in seven-day averages, which we identify as a drop of around 15% or more. Along with HRV drops, warning signs signal that one's work and overall allostatic load are starting to impact wellness. Think of these warning signs and significant declines in seven-day averages as a way that the mind, body, and behaviors alert the person that something is wrong with their current state. It is time to take action before the state worsens and they progress to later stages. Notice your physical state. Physical warning signs are often the easiest to identify. Common physical warning signs include stiff necks, sore backs, strained muscles, headaches, and other minor aches and pains that are more annoying than debilitating. The sympathetic nervous system is highly connected to trigger points throughout the body. As people carry around too much distress, the sympathetic system becomes more active, creating tightness and soreness in these sensitive points. An excellent way to distinguish the physical warning signs associated with burnout from typical aches or pains is whether a drop in HRV accompanies the warning sign. Most small injuries will not bring down the functioning of the autonomic nervous system, but physical warning signs brought on by increasing allostatic load will show up as drops in HRV. Psychological warning signs indicate an increase in sympathetic or dorsal vagal activation and include dreaming about work, trouble sleeping, obsessive worry, ruminating about work, low energy, and minor depression or anxiety. These warning signs are not at the level of a mental health diagnosis unless someone is already struggling with a psychological issue. They do put people at risk of more significant threats to their mental health if they do not take action to get out of the exhaustion stage. Physical and psychological warning signs exist within the body and mind. Social warning signs show up in professional and personal relationships. Personally, social warning signs include a lack of desire to connect with friends and family in meaningful ways and less patience with coworkers, children, and loved ones. The good thing about social warning signs is that other people might provide some feedback about the changes in behavior. 
the key is to listen. When in the exhaustion stage, people may find it harder to listen to and be present with coworkers and customers. Connecting meaningfully with others is essential to any business's success. Yet when someone is exhausted, listening, patience, and understanding become emotionally draining, which takes a lot of focus, energy, and attention. When someone holds too much stress in their cup for too long, they will find it harder to engage fully in conversation and connect meaningfully to coworkers and customers. As with the other warning signs in this stage, social warning signs will not result in marriages breaking up, friendships ending, or getting fired from jobs. However, if unaddressed, these small changes in relationships often become more significant issues with greater consequences. The important thing with all warning signs is to recognize when the mind, body, and behaviors are telling the person that something is wrong and then to act to correct the problem. In exhaustion, healthier coping skills shift to unhealthy ones. Instead of jogging or going to the gym, many opt for another glass of wine, binge-watching a new favorite television show, or spending hours lost on social media. While none of these activities is inherently bad, they should not be the primary coping skills for distress and exhaustion. The more time spent in the exhaustion stage, the harder it becomes to get out of bed in the morning, find excitement in work, and locate the energy for social interactions in their personal and professional life. The good news is that if people identify that they are in this stage, a long weekend, a few great workouts, and some time with good friends can lower the level of distress in their cups. Finding their way back into wellness should result in improved daily HRV scores. If they fail to address burnout at the exhaustion stage, they risk moving to the next stage, guilt, shame, and doubt. Guilt, shame, and doubt. It is tricky to measure when exhaustion moves to guilt, shame, and doubt from HRV averages. People might experience exhaustion for months as their seven-day averages remain lower than longer averages without any sign of recovery. Guilt, shame, and doubt are psychological reactions to someone not performing at their best. One possible HRV indicator is when monthly averages fall 5 to 10 percent below all-time averages, Let's examine some other warning signs. Most people want to bring their best self to work every day. It is uncomfortable to realize that exhaustion is decreasing their quality of work. This realization leads to feelings of doubt about their ability to regain their former level of performance. A sense of guilt and shame usually accompanies this doubt as they recognize they are not living up to their own and others' standards and expectations. It is also hard not possessing the energy to be a good co-worker or teammate. A result of guilt, shame, and doubt is a sense of hypervigilance. Because exhaustion prevents people from accomplishing everything they want at work, they start to work longer hours, often bringing work home. Just because they work longer hours does not mean they are getting more done. The opposite is true. The exhaustion from the long hours decreases energy further. While they may technically work longer hours, these hours become largely unproductive and inefficient. People may also have trouble disconnecting. They may start checking work emails at home in the evening and on vacation. They feel guilty because how can they disconnect when so many people count on them? Then they feel ashamed because the quality of their work is declining. These feelings of guilt and shame cause a dangerous cycle of emotional distress and may become noticeable in further decreases in productivity and effectiveness. This cycle creates a sympathetic response, pushing them to work longer. However, the exhaustion and sympathetic activation hinder cognitive capacity, work quality suffers, and the person struggles to find the energy necessary for the social aspects of their work. The sympathetic push is short-term and is followed by a dorsal vagal crash where they have little or no energy for family and personal life. In the second stage, people may find that it helps to talk to someone else to process these feelings and frustrations. Often an empathetic co-worker, supervisor, or friend serves as a good source of support. If they exist in this stage for long periods, they might benefit from psychotherapy to resolve their guilt, shame, and doubt. 
time off is a good idea. In the second stage, they might need two weeks off to recover from the exhaustion and regain their mental health. Time off will help with the efforts of burnout in the short term. It is important to return from the break to a healthier work-life balance and to utilize skills like HRV biofeedback in order to not end up in the same place again in a few weeks. Cynicism and callousness People can only hold guilt, shame, and doubt for so long before they trigger a defensive reaction leading to the third stage of burnout, which is cynicism and callousness. Cynicism and callousness are natural reactions to continuous experiences of exhaustion, shame, guilt, and doubt. Whereas the first two stages are emotional states resulting from an excessive allostatic load, cynicism and callousness become traits that transcend the work environment. As traits, cynicism and callousness usually take months and even years to develop. It takes a great deal of HRV data to show progression to this later stage. At best, we could speculate that seeing a year-over-year drop of 20% or more in HRV scores might indicate that someone is at risk for moving to this later stage of burnout. This significant drop might also indicate serious medical issues, so if someone experiences a year-over-year drop, they should get a physical and talk to their healthcare professional. Many people in this stage experience a dorsal vagal response. Their lack of energy results in having little patience for coworkers and customers. Others experience a sympathetic response where increased anxiety leads to disrespecting people they serve and coworkers by gossiping and acting passive-aggressively. People in this stage for extended periods will display a toxic mix of dorsal vagal and sympathetic responses throughout the day. In cynicism and callousness, these behaviors and emotions become traits in their work and personal lives. The devastation of stage 3 demonstrates why people must address burnout in stages 1 and 2 before they progress to cynicism and callousness. Everyone finds it challenging to work with people at this stage. Negative experiences with cynical and callous people make it harder to recover without drastic action. Individuals in this stage cause real hurt to others. Resentment and frustration grow beyond the point where a simple apology gets everyone back on good terms. Usually, mental health services are needed to recover from stage 3. Exhaustion, guilt, shame, and doubt are states that dissipate with some effort. Cynicism and callousness become personality traits that impact relationships at work and in personal life. If someone finds themselves in this stage, know that the path back to wellness will take time and considerable effort. HRV will help them monitor this journey. Crisis The final stage, crisis, is where no person wants to end up professionally or personally. People in the crisis stage are actively experiencing trauma from work. Due to high levels of distress, allostatic overload, and trauma over long periods, they can no longer function from a healthy place personally or professionally. If the person in crisis somehow manages to keep their job, they most likely isolate themselves from their co-workers. Rarely can co-workers maintain a healthy working relationship with someone in so much pain. The trauma of crisis transcends the work environment and prevents the person from being a decent spouse, partner, friend, or parent. Divorce and other extreme relational issues often happen when someone is in crisis due to work distress. Addiction is not uncommon and makes all the person's difficulties much more intense. Heart disease, cancer, mental illness, Alzheimer's, relationship issues, and the other scary impacts of work distress are the consequences we pay if we do not focus on our wellness. Unfortunately, unmanaged distress and burnout threaten to take years, if not decades, off our lives. Balancing the Personal and Professional Self-care is a fascinating topic in modern leadership. After this chapter, we use the terms wellness and wellness plans instead of self-care. Unfortunately, we feel the term self-care has lost much of its positive connotation in the business world, and many even view it as a negative term. 
In some circles, leaders view the idea of self-care as an excuse for the business not to focus on burnout prevention or people's health. The message many leaders implicitly or explicitly send to their people is that it is the employee's responsibility to personally manage the distress from job demands. While rarely stated bluntly, the message many hear from their leaders goes something like, Sure, we'll burn you out during the day. However, we expect you to practice self-care on your own time to perform at peak levels the next day. The JDR model demonstrates the absurdity of this approach. While researchers of the model find benefits in self-care, they do not excuse the business's responsibility to manage the distress their job demands they put on their people. We like to challenge leaders to think a specific way about job demands and self-care in high-performing businesses. A business and its leadership need to provide resources to help people handle job demands effectively. Simply stated, leaders should strive to balance distress experienced by their staff with resources provided to offset that distress. We will explore job resources in future chapters. It falls on the individual to utilize self-care to manage the distress in their personal life. Just as job resources should cancel out distress from job demands, self-care should balance any personal distress experienced outside work. Combined, job resources and self-care should set people up to engage in their work and get the best results possible for the business. In a world where burnout seems epidemic, just balancing out distress with resources and self-care is a competitive advantage. However, once a business is effectively managing job demands, in most cases, getting the team and monthly HRV averages close to population norms, why not go a step further? While balancing out distress from job demands prevents burnout, outperforming population norms helps people reach a level of peak performance crucial to creativity and innovation. Another practice we witness is leadership asking people to practice self-care and ending the discussion there. If a business is serious about people's health, they need to create and implement a concrete wellness plan. Leaders should play supportive roles and hold people and themselves accountable to these plans. Prioritizing wellness and ensuring every person has a plan integrates wellness as a central component to a business's culture. Everyone understands the connection between their health and outcomes. Unfortunately, no one gets separate cups for personal distress and work distress. Instead, an allostatic load builds throughout the day regardless of our environment. If people are going through personal trauma, it is nearly impossible to prevent it from impacting emotional, cognitive, and social functioning at work. While people should do everything possible not to let distress in their personal lives affect work quality, if their cups come into work full, quality will suffer. It is pointless to pretend people possess a superhuman capacity to drop all personal stress before entering work. Instead, leaders need to acknowledge that people's behaviors and mental health in their personal lives directly impact the quality of their work. As seen above, the same is also true about burnout impacting people's mental, relational, and medical health. After conducting hundreds of talks and trainings on wellness, it is not unusual for participants to come up after the training and share the devastating impact of work distress on their lives. My marriage broke up because of work stress. I got cancer because of burnout. I'm not the parent I know I should be because of stress at work. We have not just heard these comments once or twice, but over and over again. The research on distress in work performance presents a difficult challenge to leaders and businesses. If someone lives a particular lifestyle and makes choices that harm their mental and medical health in their personal life, it will impact their performance at work. Traditionally, what someone does outside the work environment gets little to no attention in the business literature. While this line of privacy and differentiation between work and home should continue to exist, HRV helps open up more significant conversations about health and wellness both inside and outside the workplace. Just like people only get one cup to handle distress throughout the day, their HRV score does not distinguish between work and personal distress. In later chapters, we will discuss how leaders can position wellness strategically to support healthy people. 
As HRV challenges us to connect performance and business results to both the work environment and to personal lifestyle choices, leaders and businesses that successfully support wellness will create a more engaged, motivated, creative, intelligent, satisfied, and healthier workforce as a competitive advantage. There is a strong business argument for leaders to support overall wellness, The American Psychological Association compared businesses with leaders directly involved with wellness programs to those without leadership involvement. Employees of businesses with involved leaders felt more motivated to do their best, 91% versus 38%, stated they were satisfied with their jobs, 91% versus 30%, and would recommend the company as a good place to work, 89% versus 17%. Supporting Wellness Planning Finally, let's explore integrating HRV into wellness as a strategic approach to maintaining health while maximizing productivity and effectiveness at work. HRV does more than demonstrate the adverse effects of work distress. It also helps assess whether wellness strategies are working. We include a template for a wellness plan in Appendix 4 in the handout. An effective wellness plan includes proactive and reactive strategies. Proactive strategies are daily and weekly practices that maintain health as measured by HRV. The goal of proactive strategies is for everyone to bring their best self to work every day. HRV provides daily feedback to measure the effectiveness of these proactive strategies to mitigate the negative impact of job demands and personal distress. For someone beginning to measure HRV, it is helpful to compare scores and initial averages to population norms and set some concrete goals. If their HRV is performing well compared to people in their demographics, the goal is to maintain these high scores over time. If scores are at the low end, what strategies, behavioral changes, and healthy habits will help raise scores gradually? Again, do not get too worried or excited when comparing scores to population norms. The primary focus remains on improving personal averages over time. The proactive components of a wellness plan clearly state what the person will do on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis to maintain their health and wellness. If a business is serious about wellness, they need to offer time and space throughout the workday to practice some of the strategies presented later in this audiobook. Self-care is not just about the individual's health. It is about maximizing their performance at work. HRV and identifying physical, psychological, and social warning signs are crucial parts of the wellness plan. Individuals will work with their leader to set goals and identify strategies when drops in HRV become a cause for concern. Again, population norms help direct whether the strategy needs to address improving or maintaining HRV averages. Sharing warning signs with a trusted leader allows the leader to point out when they might identify these warning signs, even if the person does not possess the self-awareness to see them because of increasing allostatic load. When people see significant drops in their HRV scores or start experiencing warning signs, they need to have created a set of reactive strategies to implement in order to get out of the exhaustion stage. The leader also can support the individual with job resources presented in future chapters. It is much easier to proactively plan how to get HRV scores back up when someone is healthy than to try and do it when energy and cognitive functioning are struggling due to burnout. To help create the reactive plan, answer these questions. What strategies will I implement if my 7-day average is significantly lower, 15% or more, than my 30-day or all-time averages? What are my strategies if my 30-day average is significantly lower, 5-10%, to than my all-time baseline? Establishing a wellness plan with a leader helps to increase accountability. This accountability needs to go both ways. The leader's psychological, social, and cognitive health is one of the most potent determinants of wellness and performance in a business. Burnout manifests in states of negative emotions, thinking, and moods. A leader's mental state is highly contagious, and a burned-out leader will burn out the people they supervise. 
Talking about and sharing wellness strategies, warning signs, and HRV scores put people in a potentially vulnerable position. A good leader supports the integration of a wellness focus into the business culture by sharing their plans with those they supervise. If the leadership holds their people accountable to their wellness plans, the leader should allow others to keep them responsible for their plans. The leader should also consider sharing their HRV scores with the team and people. Again, this strategy promotes accountability and the supportive nature of the HRV use in high-performing businesses. Once people establish wellness plans, the leader focuses on monitoring their health. HRV dashboards provide daily feedback on the health of individuals and teams. The leader should also schedule time to check in with the person at least every two weeks. This check-in allows the leader to review HRV scores, identify warning signs, and adjust plans to support someone struggling to manage distress. This scheduled check-in time helps build trust and operationalize wellness into the business's operations.